And as we look at them, their history and reliability, I want to uh, talk to you very briefly about a man named Dr. Dan Wallace. How many of you met him when he was here in Albania? Anyone here meet him? <coughs> yes, he did. Jane did. Uh, doc, you did? Good. Denise did too. Uh, Dan Wallace is a wonderful man of God. Uh, he is a student of the Greek New Testament. And he has established uh, this center for the study of New Testament manuscripts. And you can access that online. You can go to that uh, address online and you can find his institute. And he has put in digital format, electronic format, he has photographed major New Testament manuscripts and published them there so that people might see them. And he's gathered together over 5,700 manuscripts. And as you're going to see in a minute, 40 of them are from Albania. 40 of them are from Albania. He's the one who found them here. And the museum here in Tirana and some of the uh, universities around the country and colleges, didn't, they weren't aware that they had such valuable manuscripts here in Albania. And you ought to really be happy and you ought to have a gr good feeling about your nation being involved in helping to preserve the ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. And after all, if you believe like I do that Paul, according to Romans 15, came here <laughs> and was here, it's a fitting place to be. I mean, here in ancient Illyricum to uh, see the script, the manuscripts of the New Testament is, is just so exciting. And they're so beautiful. You've got to go to the museum and see the one. And when you go to the museum, let me tell you something else. Watch very carefully. I forgot the name of the place where it came from, but there was a monastery up in the mountains in one of the villages, an ancient monastery. And part of its gateway and inscription from it is in your museum here, the State Museum, right here in Toronto. And it shows the inscription, and it translates the inscription for you. And the men of that monastery date the establishing of the monastery by the number of years after Noah's flood. <clears throat> they had a date for Noah's flood that was acceptable to them. It's one of the very few inscriptions found anywhere in the entire world that dates an event or the establishment of something by the date, the number of years following Noah's flood. It's amazing. So there's something special about Albania. <laughs> I don't know whether it's in your water or the soil or what it is, but it's special here. And it's, it's just absolutely amazing. It's one of the reasons I love coming here is seeing these things. So let's move on. As we're looking at this, there are over 5,700 ancient Greek manuscripts. And the first of these are New Testament papyri manuscripts. They're made of papyrus. There's a reed that grows in Egypt. And it was harvested, and the leaves of the reed were then hammered and then layered together to form early paper. It's very rough, but it works. And they made books out of the leaves of papyrus. And there are early New Testament Greek papyri that start around A.D. 125 to A.D. 250. In other words, there are Greek papyri of books of the New Testament that exist and are copies as early as 25 years to 50 years after the New Testament is completed. It's not like the Old Testament when you have perhaps hundreds of years from the writing of the original to the completion uh, or to the, the copies that we have. Here we have far more uh, recent copies that go back to the date of the New Testament itself. It, it makes it very, very exciting. For example, here's Papyrus 457 from the John Rylands Library. And this is in England. And it's a copy here of John 18, verses 31 and 37, and it dates from A.D. 100 to 150. They keep trying to put the date down. They do uh, an analysis of the papyrus to use carbon-14 dating. They look at the writing and use the style of writing as a means. They check the uh, chemical uh, content of the ink. And they compare all those things. And it's very clear that it falls somewhere in that 50-year period of time. Which means this gospel, written by John around 90 A.D., 
may already be a copy made of it within 10 years of its completion. And we may have that copy here, even though it's a fragment. Much much has been destroyed, yet here's a fragment of a copy that comes very near to the original time of the Gospel of John. You know, that's almost like walking in Jerusalem on streets that you know Jesus walked on. <laughs> you, you get this feeling, you know, that, wow, this is amazing. I walked where Jesus walked today. And you're standing on the old Roman road. You know it's exactly the path because the Gospels talk about him having been there and walked on the road. And you're standing on that road because it's all been uncovered and exposed and you're there. You get the same feeling when you see one of these manuscripts. And, and you say, wow, whoever copied this might have known John personally. And it, it, it just it thrills your heart and mind to know. And, and it gives you confidence because as we look at these, we're not finding major differences between the New Testament we have now and the New Testament of that time within 10 years. What's here in John 18, 31, 37 is exactly what we still have. There's not one difference. It's a short section, yes, but there's no difference at all. That is amazing. We go on. Another papyrus, number 23, found in Egypt at Oxyrhynchus. It is a manuscript of James, chapter 1. And what you see there is James 1, 15 to 18, comes from A.D. 200. A wonderful manuscript, very early, made of papyrus. It goes back, and again, no differences. No differences in the reading of James 1, 15 to 18, and what this manuscript says. Here we are, nearly 2,000 years later, and we still have the same Bible. That has to give you confidence in what we have. Then we can go to another papyrus, number 90, also found in Egypt. And this is the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 36 to 19, 7, reminding us that there are multiple manuscript copies of some of the same sections of the New Testament where we can compare and see how they agree or how they disagree. It's a wonderful thing coming from the second century again. And then another papyrus, number 46, considered to be one of the most beautiful of the papyri. And this is in the Chester Beatty collection because he happened to uh, uh, purchase it and keep it and preserve it in England. It's the end of the epistle to the Romans there at the top and a heading for Hebrews. What does that tell you? In that New Testament, <laughs> Hebrews follows Romans. What do we say about the order of the books? The order of the books is not inspired. The order of the books is not important. What is important is the books, and that they're there, and that they're kept and preserved accurately. And here we have following Romans is Hebrews in this manuscript, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful one, because Hebrews chapter 1, the way it opens here, is exactly the way it opens in our Bible, by saying that God has spoken in many ways, in many times, to the fathers, and now speaks to us, and there he mentions through the signs and miracles and wonders, and now speaks to us through his Son. At, it's so beautiful to see that, and see that in a manuscript that dates back. This would be in the second century as in the 100s A.D., all right? And so that means it's within about 100 to 150 years of Jesus. We have here a copy of Hebrews and Romans in the Greek, and does not differ. In fact, for, Papyrus 46 is well known for its accuracy. And it is so identical to what we have today, it's, it, it just it gives you uh, uh, kind of goosebumps, <laughs> you say. It just, your hair begins to rise a little bit. You understand this. Is, it's proving that we have the Word of God. <clears throat> then you have other things, like an amulet, a good luck charm, a lucky charm. And someone wanted written in it the, the book of Jude. And so here this lucky charm, this amulet, would be rolled up tight and put inside probably silver or something else and worn around the neck is the book of Jude. And here, some of it's destroyed, but what's here in the picture here is Jude verses 4 and 5 and 7 and 8. 
Verse 6 is probably at the bottom of the left-hand column and, and is gone. It's been destroyed. And this dates from the 3rd or 4th centuries. It comes from Egypt again, where there were Christian communities. And again, no major differences with what we have in our Bible today. Those of you who have studied some Greek, you can actually take pictures uh, like this and sit down with your Greek New Testament and compare and see that they're the same. <coughs> We talked about the Greek manuscripts, the papyri. Now let's talk about the codexes, the books. Because the papyri are individual books, and the codexes are a compilation of books, except in a few cases. We saw one papyri there with Romans and Hebrews. So you do have a change in some of them. But the codexes, the ones that are big and that we know about, again, we talked about Vaticanus, Alexandrinus and uh, Sinaiticus for the Old Testament because they're the Greek translation of the Old Testament, but they also have added to them the Greek of the New Testament. So it's the entire Bible from about the 4th century A.D. And so you have Vaticanus. Again, here's an example of Vaticanus with Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the verse we were talking about. The book, it begins there with Biblios, the, book for, the word for book. The book of the generations. And it's the bib Biblos of Genesis, is what it says. The generation, generation, is drawn from the word Genesis. Because it's from the Greek verb genao, which means to be born. And so that rabbi friend of mine, we were reading this, one of the things he pointed to, he says, wow. He said, do you realize that Genesis as a word is used 40 times in Matthew chapter 1? And he said that, he says, Matthew, he says, just as relentless. Matthew does not give up. And it was interesting. I, I kept saying, well, Joe, do you believe him? He said, he says, I'm a Jew. He says, I don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But he says, Matthew certainly believed it. And he says, he believed Genesis too. So he says, we do have something in common. But he said, he's very clearly saying that the truth he has is equal to the truth that the Jews have like in the book of Genesis. I said, that's right. And in order for you to have salvation from your sins, you need to believe that. You need to believe this Jesus, that he is the Messiah. He sees very clearly that that's what the claim of the New Testament is, that that's the claim of Matthew. And uh, he, said, he, he says Matthew's relentless. He doesn't give up. He insists on this, and he spends the entire gospel proving it. Pray for him. I hope he gets saved someday. We have uh, Vaticanus, Ephesians 1, 1 to 3. And I've given you a reference down there that you can go to to see this manuscript yourself. And we have Sinaiticus as well. And uh, you have a picture of Sinaiticus in Matthew chapter 1. And it says the same thing as you saw in the earlier one in Vaticanus. And in John chapter 1 as well, the same thing we have in our Bibles now. And uh, we have Alexandrinus. And as you look at Alexandrinus, there's an example of Alexandrinus from 2 Peter 3.16 and 1 John. Notice the order there is the same as we have now. That after 2 Peter, we have 1 John. And it's a very fascinating book as you, as you look at that and understand that he, this is a section also talking about those who wrestle with the letters of Paul as they do with other scripture and putting that in there. And then other passages of Alexandrinus you can see here from Luke chapter 12. And you can see another uh, one down here. I'm sorry, somehow the links here of animation disappeared so I have to click it several times to get to it. But... This is a codex called Ephraim, and it, it, this, what you see there is Matthew chapter 20, verses 16 to 23, dates from the 5th century, and this manuscript is found in a library, the National Library in Paris, and it's a palimpsest, like we saw of the triglot of the Samaritan Pentateuch. In other words, someone had used it for something else, then it was erased, and on top of it was written Matthew chapter 20, about the 5th century A.D., just one of many of the manuscripts. And then Codex Bizai is another famous codex. 
Uh, this is Luke chapter 23 here. This is from the 6th century, found in a library at the University of Cambridge. And Clara Montanus is another one. And uh, this manuscript is Romans 7, where I've given you the part here. Now, when I give you the portion here, that doesn't mean that only that is found in that manuscript. It's just I've chosen one part of it to show you. So the references in your note are for the picture I'm showing you, not telling you how much of the New Testament is in that manuscript. For getting that, you can go to a Greek New Testament that in the front of it lists the manuscripts and tells you what all is included in the manuscript. So this is only a part of it that I've selected and given in a picture for you so you can see what it looks like and see the, the Greek the way it's written. You'll notice that all of these so far, if any of you know Greek, these are all in capital uh, Greek letters. Capital letters, not lowercase. And notice there's no word spaces. No word spaces. They just run on. And so you have to be able to know enough Greek to divide the words yourself. And you have to know all the capital letters real well, which has always been a challenge for students since they learn the lowercase first. And that's what our New Testament editions are written in. And so when they go back and try to read these unseals, an unseal is capital letters used in the manuscript, also called majuscules, that's what they see. <coughs> and then Laudianus is another one that we have, and it dates from the 7th century. And this is Acts 15, it's found in the uh, library at Oxford University in England. And then we have the minuscules. All that we've looked at till now are those that are written in capital letters. This, from the 9th or 10th centuries in the British Museum, is uh, showing you John 20, verses 11 to 17, and now we finally have the lowercase letters. But notice still, there's no firm division of the words. There are only a few places where you have a mark, a punctuation, to indicate the end of a verse or the end of a sentence. And you have a space to indicate a change, perhaps, in uh, verses or paragraphs or sometimes chapters. That's it. So it's very different than what we're used to reading in our translations and uh, the way that we see it. Now let's talk about the ones found here in Albania. Everything listed on the next few slides is here in Albania. Found in your museum. Some of those manuscripts you can gain access to with special permission. A few of them are in display in your national museum. Uh, I tried to get permission to show you pictures of them, and I checked with Dan Wallace and his organization, and he said, well, you can have our permission, but that's not adequate. You have to get permission from the authorities in Albania. And uh, he said, we do not have anything but the permission to put these things online, and you're warned that you cannot use these in PowerPoint presentations out here. And I did not have the time to wait for the Albanian authorities to give me permission, so I had to omit the pictures. You don't have the pictures, so you're going to have to go look at it yourself in person, which is far better anyway. But I'm going to talk about three different ones. Uh, one here that's uh, titled GA043, one that is GA1143, and uh, then we're going to talk about another one. And uh, here's an example, GA043, and by the way, you know, see, here what I did. The picture's gone. <laughs> I tell you, go, go see it in the museum, all right? Go see this in the museum and uh, get a look at it because these are absolutely amazing. They really are. And you ought to be very pleased that you have been part of that. This manuscript that I had a photograph there, you can see the same photograph if you go to the website, Dan Wallace's website, you can pull it up and see it there. And uh, when you look at that, you can see the 6th century manuscript written in capital letters, it's a majuscule, and that's 6th century AD. Think about that. That is not real recent. It's not like the 12th or 13th centuries like many manuscripts. This is very early. 6th century. This is before the time of the prophet of Islam. Think about that. You have a manuscript of the Greek New Testament 
before Islam even became a religion, before their prophet became the prophet of Islam, you here in Albania have a copy of the Greek New Testament in Greek, and you can look at it and see that it has not been corrupted. It's the same now as it was before Islam. We'll talk about that later this afternoon. That's a huge point to realize when you're talking with your Muslim friends. They believe that it's all been corrupted. When was it corrupted? They believe since the prophet. They believe that the New Testament, the time of the prophet, was still something you can read. It was not corrupted. They believe it's corrupted now. But the evidence contradicts that completely. Because here, you have a manuscript here in Toronto, before the prophet lived, and you can compare it with what New Testament we have now, and you can demonstrate it has not been corrupted. It has not been changed. It has not been altered. It's very, very important. Another one is GA1143. This is a 9th century minuscule written in lowercase letters. Again, you need to go to the library or the museum here to see it, or you need to go online to Dan Wallace's organization to see a picture of it. It is absolutely amazing. And then, and I believe the first of those, 43, is the one that's known as the Purple Codex. It's the one that's on beautiful vellum, it's a parchment, and it's kind of purple colored. Between, my wife says it's almost red. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't see colors that well to distinguish the way my wife does. And so many of you women will look at it, and you'll know exactly what color it is, and you'll tell us whether it's really purple or not. But it's, it's in that range, and it's written in beautiful silver and gold lettering. Very, very good. Sixth century A.D. You have that treasure here. It's It's amazing. But you also have a series of lectionaries. A lectionary is a collection of readings. When a preacher is getting ready for his Sunday sermon, he might collect different passages of the New Testament together on a certain topic, and he might use them devotionally during the week, pray over them, and prepare his message, his sermon. And then sometimes those lectionaries are provided for the people of the church to use as devotionals throughout the week to take those readings, selected readings, from the New Testament. And this is an example of one of those lectionaries from the 12th century A.D. Uh, 40 manuscripts in Greek here, dating from the 6th century all the way down to the, I believe, the 15th century. You have almost a thousand years of history of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament right here in Albania. And it's, it's an amazing thing to see. And what I did on, on this lectionary is I was going to show you a picture of it at the uh, uh, lectionary of the Gospels that shows collections of readings of the Gospels, almost like a harmony of the Gospels from the 12th century. Actually, uh, the date on it is specific. Someone, somewhere along the way, maybe the original scribe, put the date on this manuscript of 1181 A.D. 1181 A.D. All right. So, what have we done? We've looked at these 40 manuscripts that are published by Dan Wallace that are from Albania, all the way down to the 15th century. And so, again, we go back and say, okay, we have all these manuscript evidence, but we have something else, too. As in the Old Testament, there are translations of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, in the Septuagint, into Syriac, into Samaritan Hebrew, into Latin, so also we have translations of the New Testament from the Greek and other languages that were done very early on. And the first of these is the Syriac Peshitta itself. And this is an example of Matthew chapter 15 from a Syriac translation of the New Testament. And besides Syriac, we have Old Latin, just like in the Old Testament. There's an Old Latin edition that goes very early. And here's an example from A.D. 400 in what is known as Cyprian's Bible. Why? Because this manuscript appears to have been copied from a manuscript that was used by Cyprian uh, in the early church. It has all the characteristics of it. 
And so this manuscript dates to 400 AD, but Cyprian lived 100 to 200 years earlier. And it seems to be the exact same type of thing, the same readings, because it has peculiar spellings of some of the words, and also has certain changes, not major changes, very minor changes that don't change the meaning uh, in any huge fashion and don't contradict any doctrine whatsoever, just minor changes in either the uh, wording, maybe using a different preposition in place of another preposition that both mean the same thing, and the writer, the, the perhaps the scribe, uh, either in reading it, was thinking it, and just put it in a, with a preposition he was familiar with having the same meaning, or if it was being read aloud, he may have been distracted momentarily and thought, okay, it meant by, but there are three different <coughs> Greek prepositions that can mean by, and so he selects one. It doesn't change the meaning. Doesn't change the statement. Doesn't change the truth. But it is a difference in the text. And so that's the type of thing that you watch for when you see that same type of change or that same mistake by a scribe that you find repeated in other manuscripts. They all apparently were dependent upon the first manuscript to make that mistake. And so you can gather them together in families of manuscripts in that fashion. And that's why this is called Cyprian's Bible. And then we have uh, the Latin Vulgate itself is also another edition that we can look at. And here is Matthew chapter 12 in a uh, Vulgate edition from the British Museum from the 6th or 7th century AD. And in fact, uh, this one is not uh, Codex Amiantinus, but it's another one from about the same period of time. And it has the text of Matthew 12 uh, that I use there for it. And here's Codex Amiantinus in the New Testament, here looking at Luke chapter 5. You saw it earlier with Psalm 23. And now you're seeing it with Luke chapter 5 because that Vulgate manuscript in Latin is the entire Bible, Old and New Testaments, published or written, copied in Ireland about, the, about 700 A.D. And then you have Coptic. And that is a different language. Some of you may be familiar with the Coptic Christians in Egypt or in Ethiopia. The Copts are from uh, Egypt originally. And so they, remember we talked about some of the papyri that were found in the New Testament in Egypt? Well, some of those were among Christians who were members of the Coptic churches in Egypt, just as there are many there today, members of the Coptic church. And some of the earliest translations of the Greek New Testament into another language include translation into Coptic. And here's an example of a manuscript that includes Luke chapter 5 that was uh, translated about the 8th century, translated copy about the 8th century A.D. So those are the, where you can go to look for old versions also to test the reading that you're looking at in the New Testament. And Armenian, not Arminian, it's not the doctrinal position of Arminius, but this is Armenia, the location of Armenia, where the genocide took place back a hundred years ago. The Armenians also have a translation of the Greek New Testament into the Armenian language. In the 9th century AD, this manuscript is from that period of time, uh, Mark chapter 4 and uh, through 5. And so that can also be used to compare with Greek manuscripts. So there are ancient versions available in the New Testament as well as in the Old. So what about the accountability we have? We've already talked about this, so this is just a brief review before we have a Q&A. Uh, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. Again, the caution. We are not to add to, we're not to take away from the words of God. This was a formula that was used in the establishing of treaties or covenants in ancient Israel. They would publish them. When you had a treaty between a conquering king and the people who have been defeated, a treaty was written and was erected in a public place, and part of it was saying, you are not to alter or change any wording of this treaty. It's covenant language. It's covenant language. That God has placed us in a covenant relationship to Him. And He is the sovereign. And He dictates to us the terms of that covenant 
It's stipulations that we are to obey. And he tells us, you do not alter the words of my covenant with you. Mosaic covenant, Deuteronomy. You do not alter it. You do not alter it. Proverbs chapter 30. You do not alter it. That could be a reference to the Davidic covenant. Jeremiah chapter 26. You do not alter the covenant I made with you. That could even be a reference to the new covenant with Israel. Because it's, the new covenant is given in chapter 31. Just a few chapters later. And then, of course, the New Testament revelation, what is the covenant that's primarily in view? The new covenant. God is saying, my covenanted people, those people with whom I have bound myself together in a relationship, and I have commanded them, I've instructed them in how to live for me, you do not have the right to change my covenant. You cannot change my word. You are bound legally, spiritually, to keep it as I gave it, as, as God speaking, as He gave it to us. We cannot change it, and we are account held accountable. Let's use one illustration before we close. I like to use this illustration, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. The new King James says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But without even knowing Greek, with only knowing Albanian or English, as you look at this, the question is John 19, 36. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. So how do we solve this problem of Paul and the institution there talking about the Lord's table, the communion, when he says, apparently it says, that it's broken for you. But it seems to contradict John 19, verse 36. How do we solve that? Did I get the right one here? There we go. Uh, as we go further, we find out that uh, Matthew 26, 26 says, and as they were eating Jesus... Jesus established the Lord's table, right? Not Paul. Paul is saying, as the Lord has given to us. So how did the Lord give it? Well, he said, this is my body. He did not say, my body is broken. He said, this is my body. And we go to Luke. In Luke chapter 22. And see what Luke said. This is my body which is given for you. Not broken. This is for you. Which means the same thing as given for you. So when you go back to 1 Corinthians, what do we learn? Broken is the reading in a very distinct minority of Greek manuscripts. It does not match the rest of Scripture. It does not match the Gospels. It does not match what is the testimony of both Matthew, Luke, and John about what Jesus said and what was to occur. It is a corruption by later human beings in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to have the word broken. And if you check the Greek manuscript evidence, it overwhelmingly supports the reading of either Matthew or Luke rather than what many of our versions have now in 1 Corinthians. That's doing textual criticism. That's allowing the Scripture to interpret Scripture. You see? So see, textual criticism or solving problems in our Bible doesn't have always to do with us having to run to the Greek or to the Hebrew, as we saw earlier. It has to do with just listening to the entirety of the Word of God. One time I met Francis Schaeffer, and he was in a conference, and after the first session he had a Q&A. And a young man stood in the balcony and said, Dr. Schaefer, when I read my Bible, I, I come to places where I just don't understand and it appears that there's a contradiction in God's Word. Like 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Dr. Schaefer, what do you do when you find those contradictions? Dr. Schaefer didn't hesitate a moment. He says, I keep on reading. And then he explained why. He says, my ignorance is often removed by the Scripture itself, by my continuing to read. The Scripture will interpret itself. 
And that's what we've done with 1 Corinthians 11. We've solved a problem just by letting Scripture speak. And if you do have the evidence to go and look at these things in Greek manuscripts, you'll find out that your conclusion on the basis of Scripture is accurate. And you did it without having to collect the manuscripts and go look at them. You just looked at the Word of God. That gives us a valuable principle, doesn't it? Just like we found out in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 19. Listen to all Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. The problems we have due to our ignorance can be removed by the wisdom of God given by His Spirit.